if they keep dividing you and you keep seeing your fellow man or your you know fellow peer as 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 a threat and you see their ideas as threatening um or you see their race as threatening or their economic status as threatening or their sex as threatening or their binary nature as threat or non-binary nature as threatening um then then that's going to keep you apart it's going to limit your strength it's going to weaken you and it's going to make you vulnerable to all forms of control and manipulation and so you cannot allow that to happen you must you must unite however you do that and you do that through you do that through openness you do that through an open mind you do that through a subjugating of your own beliefs, right? You you articulate your beliefs, but you don't become so wedded to them that it has to be your way. Okay? It's not about you. It's not about me. It's about us. If you have that mindset that it's not about me, it's about us, then your power is unlimited. Hello and welcome to another exciting episode of the Lewis and Kyle Show. Today we had the pleasure of interviewing former Nevada Attorney General George Chanos. George spent over 30 years as a practicing lawyer before becoming the Attorney General for Nevada. George made lots of money being successful in real estate, and he gives some of those stories in this episode. But primarily, we bring George on the show to discuss his experience as an author. In 2012, George had a life-threatening heart attack, which changed his whole perspective on everything. So he kind of put the majority of what he's doing on pause, uh, though he's also currently the chairman of Capriotti's and Wing Zone, those franchises. But in his semi retirement, he's published two books. This conversation focuses more on his second book, The Millennial Samurai, which is a discussion of three main topics. One, coming future changes we should expect from technology. That's stuff to do with outer space. That's crypto. That's AI. That's health stuff like longevity. And if we're going to live forever, how does that change things? The second part of the book is the major problems in society right now and kind of just a holistic overview of them. That's food shortages, that's climate stuff, that's politics, that's gerrymandering, lots of things there. And then the third piece of the book is how to prepare yourself to benefit from these changes rather than be exploited by them. That is the general overview from these conversations, hitting a little bit on each of those subjects, and uh, it was a blast. I hope you learn as much as we did from this conversation, and I will switch to it now. This episode is brought to you by our friends at VASA, the virtual assistant staffing agency. We hired our first virtual assistants from VASA to assist with our operations running the show back in June. But VASA is not just for podcast editors. If you need some extra hands to free up your time, let VASA help you with hiring for administrative, technical, and creative work. That's graphic design, cold callers, social media managers, sales reps, video editors, admin assistants, and more. Free up your time to focus on your highest impact work and learn more about VASA at vastaffing.agency or by clicking the link in the show notes to schedule a free strategy session with their team. Alrighty, back to the show. George, welcome to the Lewis and Kyle show. Thank you. Great to be here. Yeah, of course. Uh, we'll intro you in a, in a different track. You know, obviously you've done a ton of stuff from being the, the attorney general of the state of Nevada, the chairman of a couple of really interesting uh, franchise businesses that are in the food industry. But I want to start somewhere else. Um, so on this podcast, we interviewed the, fa or the, the person who invented the stent. Um, and I know that the stent has had a very important role in your life and in, and in this story specifically. And, and through that conversation with Dr. Richard Schatz, he told us about how there was a time where he was presenting the idea of the stent to a room full of, of cardio cardiologists and he's being laughed at. They were saying, you know, this is stupid, never going to work. So my first question for you is how important is it to be willing to be laughed at? Yeah. So, um, it, uh, um, it reminds me of, uh, Plato's allegory of the cave, um, where, you know, people inside the cave had a certain existence and a certain understanding, a certain level of understanding. And then when one of them ventured out of the cave and saw the real world and then tried to come back in and explain what he had seen, he was ridiculed as, um, you know, um, not being in sync with uh, with the people that he was talking to. 
and they didn't understand what he was talking about. And so, um, you know, people that are out ahead of the curve on, um, on certain issues, uh, like the, the doctor that you're describing or the, the uh, inventor that you're describing, um, they run that risk of uh, being rejected um, by the masses because the, the masses or the um, existing consensus hasn't caught up to where they are. They're, they're way out in front. And um, I run that risk right now in, in talking about the issues that I talk about because um, you know, I'm talking about the future. I'm talking about what's going to happen over the next 30 years and how it's going to impact our lives. And if you're not looking at something, then you really don't know what's happening in the area that you're not looking at, right? So if I ask you what's happening behind you, um, and you know somebody could be you know mimicking or miming behind you silently and you wouldn't know it um, or I ask you what's happening you know across the street in your neighbor's home you have no idea because um, you're not looking um, so I have been looking for the past 10 years at how the future is going to develop over the next 30 years and most people aren't looking at that and so most people don't know about it they don't have the luxury or the time to spend looking at what's going to happen over the next 30 years. They're focused on what's going to happen tomorrow, what's going to happen next week, what's going to happen next month. Um, I call that the trees as opposed to the forest. Very few of us are looking at the forest. Um, I'm more interested in the forest because I've been you know, focused on the trees my entire life and now I've had this opportunity because of my heart attack, it led into a you know, the, the stint example, I had a heart attack in 2012. I had two stints put into my heart and uh, it was a, um, a brush with death, if you will. And it, uh, it, it tends to change your perspective, right? You, you start to think of life as being more fleeting and more fragile. And so you don't take it for granted. And when you don't take it for granted, you start to ask questions like, you know, why am I here? What am I doing? What am I going? How much time am I going to have left? What am I going to do with that time that I have left? What's the highest, best use, highest and best use of my time? How do I want to be remembered? How do I want to go out? And um, so you start looking at things and start thinking in ways that you might not have in the past. Um, I had never looked at the future in my entire life. I knew nothing about what was going to happen over the next 30 years until I started looking. And um, so, you know, to answer your question, basically, um, you ha it, it requires a level of courage. You have to, you have, to have the courage to um, buck the trend and to, you know, um, believe in yourself and, and uh uh, have convictions in in what it is that you think is right and what it is, uh, you know, what your conclusions are. Um, you have to have an open mind. You have to try to gather information. You have to search for the truth. You have to try to be, you know, accurate as opposed to right. You know, you don't want to just be right. You want to be accurate. Um, and uh, there's a difference. Um, right is you're conceding that I'm right and you're wrong, but I still may not be accurate. Um, and I'm not, uh, I'm not focused on being right. I'm, I'm focused on finding out what the truth is. And um, I don't care if it comes from me or if it comes from you or if it comes from you know, some doctor that's invented something that's new to me. I care that it's accurate. Yeah, I think the... Carl Sagan quote, I was pulling it up just to get it off memory, uh, at the kind of beginning of the book in the foreword is really interesting. Kind of like, you know, the, the, I have a sticker on my computer, whether or not you like him or not. I like the saying from Ben Shapiro, right. That's kind of like facts don't care about your feelings. And that was his big line in 2016 or whatever. And you have this Carl Sagan quote from 1995 that like, I'm worried we're going to descend into a society where we care more about like what feels good versus what is true. And you just have to have, yeah. I know I, yeah. I'm going to use the, the, yeah. Go ahead. Well, the, the, the first the first priority in finding the truth is in making it a priority, right? You know, you you're not going to find the truth unless you commit to that being your objective, right? Um, 
one of the things that that I've learned. So one of the you know there are a lot of disadvantages in age, right? In getting older, right? Getting older comes with uh, a lot of disadvantages come with that. But one of the advantages, one of the few advantages with old age is perspective, right? You have a greater perspective because you've had a longer period of time to observe data and, and behavior, right? And so you've seen some of this play out before, um, or you've, you know, the history that you are familiar with teaches you lessons that you might see today. Um, and so the, uh, the bottom line is that what I, what I now understand as a 64 year old man is number one, um, that I don't have all the answers. Okay. And if I, and, and, and I'm pretty, you know, I'm pretty well read and, 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 and educated and, um, and I'm, you know, been doing a lot of research and reading, trying to find the truth for many, many years. And if I don't know all the answers, then there's a good chance that you don't know all the answers and that others don't know all the answers. And so the first understanding is that none of us have all the answers. Um, the second understanding is that um, our brains are not just seekers of truth. They're also advocates for that which we already believe, right? So if we believe something is true, our brain will act in advocacy of that belief and it will, um, it will resist information, information that is inconsistent with the brain's current beliefs will be met with cognitive dissonance and it will feel uncomfortable. So if you believe that, you know, Donald Trump is an awful person, right? And all of a sudden he does something that is, you know, incredibly inconsistent with that kind of uh, expectation, that may not be understood by people, right? They may uh, see that with suspicion. They may uh, think it really didn't happen. Right. So the brain might say, well, this doesn't make sense. Right. This is an awful man. How could he do these you know, good things? Or you think someone is good and, um, you know, you have a very strong belief that they're good and uh, you find out they do something horrible and it creates cognitive dissonance. So the brain isn't always that open to information that is inconsistent with what it currently believes. Um, it sets up roadblocks. Um, it engages in confirmation bias. It engages in motivated reasoning. Um, and so you, you, the more you understand the way your brain works, the more you understand um, how to judge and assess information, right? So if you understand that your brain might be naturally unreceptive to disconfirming information, then um, you might want to look at that disconfirming information more closely, right? And you might want to give it a chance. And um, that would, uh, uh, and if you're interested in the truth, then that would cause you to want to have a more open mind. Um, you also want to know that people, um, that people's brains are, you know, maybe physically very similar, but the information that has been loaded into those brains throughout the life of the host is very different than the information that has been loaded into your brain or my brain, right? So our brains receive 11 million bits of information per second. That's been happening throughout our lives. And yet our conscious brain can only process 15 to 50 bits of information per second. So what that tells you is that 99% of the information that's coming into your brain and that's been coming into your brain throughout your life, the vast majority of it has come in through your unconscious brain outside of your conscious awareness, right? This, and this tells us a number of things. Number one, that you're going to see the world differently uh, than I am or that anyone else is going to. Um, your brain is going to see it differently. Um, number two, uh, you haven't consciously assessed the great majority of information that is in your brain. Um, it's just there and it's affecting the way you judge things and see things, um, but you haven't given it the kind of discernment and challenge and interrogation 
that you do of information that you process consciously, right? So, um, and it also tells us that, you know, your neighbor or the guy in another country um, or halfway across the world, he has a very different perspective. His brain has received very different information. So he's naturally going to see the world very differently than you are. And so you have a choice. You can treat this as a threat um, or you can treat it as an asset. I choose to treat it as an asset because if someone has a perspective that I don't have, I can only profit from hearing that perspective. It gives me a new perspective. It gives me more information. It gives me a different way of looking at things. And if I have an open mind towards it and I consciously process that alternative disconfirming information, I'm more likely to arrive at the truth. So this is all the process of critical thinking that you need to go through, that we all need to go through. Um, we all need to understand that we have this vulnerability, that our brain is a double-edged sword. It is at once our greatest asset and tool, and at the same time, our greatest liability. Um, it's not just all good, and it's not all bad by any stretch. Um, the brain is very malleable because that helps it learn. It, it, the the, uh, the sponge-like quality allows us to take in vast quantities of information. We'd be very limited if we had to consciously process it all, right? So it is a, uh, a benefit to learning, but it, al it also creates an exposure that someone who wants to feed us misinformation can leverage, right? And now you've got ubiquitous social media and the ability of anyone to reach you through your phone, right? And um, your phone has 100,000 times the computing power that NASA had in 1969. So you're carrying around this amazing tool and uh, anybody can reach you on it and they can weaponize the information that they send you, the information that they send, uh, you know, your younger siblings, the information that they send disenfranchised, uh, angry people in, in economically blighted populations, right, to agitate. Um, they can mislead voters. Uh, they can do all sorts of things. So it's, it's good to be conscious of all of this, right? I believe it's very important that we be conscious of all of this. I think more people should be talking about this. Unfortunately, few are. Um, but uh, it's an important point that I, uh, uh, I'm glad we were able to get out. I mean, there's a million ways we could uh, dive into kind of some of the follow-up questions there. What's your degree of, I guess, optimism or cynicism about that last point? Like the degree to which it's intentional, like, do they want, again, we keep using, it's the worst word in like the dictionary, right? Is they, it's like the, yeah. the most lazy expression, but to what extent do you believe like, you know, powers that be and however you define that are encouraging the development of critical thinking or actively trying to keep certain groups like away from a meta awareness about like the type of conversation we're just having in terms of like, you're susceptible to these types of things and they will lead you to be susceptible to this type of influence. And, or do you have like a degree of optimism about that being kind of uh, reversed in some substantial way? Because I think it's for a lot of podcast listeners, especially, I think it's a pretty self-selecting demographic and especially this podcast, there's a lot of like, a lot of these conversations kind of like get brought up. Like I, I, there are a lot of, in terms of like, you know, people listen to podcasts because traditional forms of media, like at some point they just got really disconnected from them. They're like, this isn't doing it for me. This is shallow. This is unentertaining. Yeah. Like I prefer to like listen to just smart people long form. And there's like a craving for that. And so do you have like a degree of like optimism? It could be legislatively if there's like, you know, just a certain breaking point where like, this is just too much power for one group to have, like the ability of, I don't want to name names with terms of companies, just a Facebook or a Twitter possesses such an insane power that no group should possess. And it's led to this manipulation of the population, which is just undeniable. And the only way to stop it is X. Like what's your kind of outlook, I guess, would, is the question I'm trying to get to so for all, that yeah. phenomenon over time. So, so first of all, I, um, I do have optimism, um, but my source of optimism is you, <laughs> you know, um, my source of optimism is listening to young people like yourselves. Um, because that is the only, um, that is our only salvation really is, is people like you. Um, when you come to centers of power 
or concentrations of power. Um, I, um, I don't have uh, a great deal of optimism with regard to concentrations of power. Um, whether those are government concentrations of power or whether that's a Google or a Facebook um, or, you know, an Amazon, um, I don't have uh, a great deal of optimism in those behemoths because ultimately they take on a life of their own. Uh, they have their own priorities. You know, for example, in the political sphere, um, the Republican Party as a party has its own priorities. The Democratic Party as a party has its own priorities and they have leadership of those parties. And when you become a leadership a member of the leadership of one of those parties, um, your allegiance between the public that you're supposed to be representing and the party that you're supposed to be representing um, creates a tension. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's a conflict um, where, you know, ultimately, I think that, that governments evolve to a point where they realize that, uh, and, and, you know, you can justify anything that you do. So, so, you know, let's say government, let's say the government in China. That's example. another superpower of the brain, right? The ability yeah. to rationalize and view yourself yeah. in yeah. a good light, no matter what you're doing. It's motivated reasoning, right? We're, we're motivated to believe that what we're doing is in the, you know, in the interest of humanity or that we're a good person. And, um, so let's take the Chinese, for example, the Chinese have a very authoritarian, um, type of uh, uh, regime, right? So they have phones where we have credit scores, FICA scores that you want to buy a home, you have a credit score. The Chinese on their phone have uh, social scores, right? So if you act out on an airplane in China, um, it will, you'll get your social score dinged, right? So you'll, you'll generate a lower social score and you may be prohibited from boarding a plane. You may not be able to get on a plane or even a bus, you know, for some period of time. Uh, that can happen from any kind of uh, uh, infraction, any kind of criminal wrongdoing, any kind of, uh, you know, speaking out against the Chinese government could cause a, uh, a major decline in your social score. Uh, it could limit your ability to get work. It could uh, limit your uh, access to um public benefits. Um, and they may rationalize that. They may say that, you know, we need this. We need to have, you know, constant ubiquitous surveillance of our population to maintain a safe environment for the public, right? To fight crime. We must have this massive surveillance um, to, um, to have law and order and to have people not smoking on airplane rest restrooms and not fighting with stewardesses. We need uh, you know, some kinds of mechanisms to control the public. Um, in Saudi Arabia, you, know, you, you steal something, they cut off your hand, right? So um, they may feel after thousands of years of dealing with their public that they need these draconian measures to make it safe for their society. Um, maybe it's to make it safe for their society. Maybe it's to make it safe for the ruling class, you know, um, but however, whatever their rationale is they're you know, they obviously believe they're doing the right thing. Um, so I don't think that you can count on, I don't have great optimism when it comes to those groups. Um, I have great optimism when it comes to your generation, uh, um, being more intelligent, being more empowered, technologically empowered, being more aware, um, seeing the mistakes. You know, my generation has done some wonderful things. We've created some, uh, some of the tools that you're going to use um, in your future. Um, but our, the way we looked at things um, or in the way that some of us still look at things is influenced by our past, right? So, for example, you may have people who have been very, um, very much oriented as capitalists, right? And they had success, right? Your parents might have had success as capitalists, you know, and they might have trained, you know, uh, educated you to say that, you know, you need to work hard, you need to go to school, you need to follow the path that they followed. Um, 
and uh, you know they'll advise you on what worked for them over the prior 30 or 40 years of their life. And you know they're giving you the, the best insights that they have, the heartfelt insights that they had based on their life experience. But the reality is, is that your life experience is going to be very different and it's going to require adjustments. It's going to require a different tact, a different approach, right? And, and so you want to try to understand what works in what they did and what didn't work in what they did and then make the appropriate changes. So, you know, some changes that are required that they didn't make are radical changes to the political system, right? So, for example, we have today, um, and I'm way out ahead on this. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm that uh, that doctor who got ridiculed because of his stints, you know, uh, on on saying something like this. But um, first of all, let me say I I very deeply believe in America. Okay, America has been very good to me. I love America. Um, I want nothing but the best for all Americans. I want America to be that leading light in the world. Um, I want it to create, help create a better world. But that doesn't mean that I ignore America's deficiencies or I don't criticize America when it's wrong, right? Um, it, it means the contrary. It means that I have to hold America accountable. I have to see where they're failing and I have to point it out. And one of the areas that we're failing in is representative government, right? So we send these, we elect these politicians. First of all, we gerrymander, right? These, these congressional districts and the Republicans and the Democrats, two parties get together and they set up these gerrymandered districts that are 95% Republican or 95% Democrat, where a Republican running in District A is almost guaranteed to win and anyone other than a Republican in District A is almost guaranteed to lose. And then in, in District B, the reverse is true and it's democratically uh, centered. And so a Democrat who's very you know, liberal in his views is almost guaranteed to win. A Republican is almost guaranteed to lose and a moderate is likely to lose in either of these districts or a non-Democrat or non-Republican, a non-partisan, is likely to lose in both of these districts. And all the districts are one or the other. So what they're doing is they're perpetuating their party, right? They're perpetuating their two-party system. And that's a very, very bad thing, number one. So we begin with a very bad thing. We send off these either Republicans or Democrats, which in your age group, I'm a nonpartisan. I, I was a registered Republican but I re-registered as a nonpartisan in 2016 because the country had presented me with two horrible choices, Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. And I thought neither one deserved to be president of the United States. How could the country give me, you know, any system that yields these two candidates and only these two candidates as the only choices for the American public is a failed system in my view. And uh, I wrote a letter to the New York Times in 2016 saying this, that the uh, two-party system was the walking dead, that these were the canaries in the coal mine, that this was just, you know, the warning sign that uh, the system is in failure. And, um, you know, any system of uh, um, uh, this many people in the world and in the United States, um, what do we have, 234, 5 million, I believe, um, that yields these two candidates is a is a failed system. And so um, the writing is on the wall. And then we got Joe Biden and Donald Trump. Again, two very, very poor candidates, right? And now I don't know what we're going to get in 2024, but no system can consistently yield this type of, uh, you know, below expectation uh, representatives um, and, and survive for long, number one. Number two, we send these people off to Washington, D.C., and they are surrounded by a ratio of 20 to 1 by lobbyists, paid lobbyists from special interests who are there full-time surrounding our representatives 
convincing them to do things on behalf of these special interests. Now, these are supposed to be our fiduciaries, right? They're supposed to represent the American public. And yet they go off to Washington and they're surrounded by these corporate interest lobbyists. That's a horrible system. Now, now we've never fixed it. In my generation, we've never fixed it. But I believe you need to fix it and I believe you can fix it. And one of the ways that you can fix it, I believe it's gonna require systemic change. I don't believe it's term limits. I don't believe it's a multi-party system. I don't believe that there are small fixes. These are all small fixes. You know, term limits are good. Multi-party system is good. Uh, pro rata voting, you know, is good. These are all, but they're minor kind of changes to, uh, they, don't really, they don't really get to the core of the problem. The core of the problem is that we have underqualified people who are serving as our representatives and are not acting as our fiduciaries. That's the, that's the bottom line problem right? And that's what you have to address. And so, you know, saying I'm going to limit their term, so I'm going to have an underqualified person who's not acting in his fiduciary capacity, but I'm only going to leave him there for a little while, and then I'm going to get another one that's the same thing. That doesn't do it. Or I'm going to get multi-parties, and uh, they're all going to behave the same way, just I'm going to have some more choices, right? That doesn't do it. So um, I'm I have sort of a radical view on this. I believe what, what today is considered, would be considered a radical view, uh, view, which is that we have the technology, we have blockchain technology, we have facial recognition, we have encryption, we have the ability to create a decentralized uh, representative government, non-representative government, where, a where there's democracy. direct voter participation, where the voters could directly vote on all of these issues, right? All of the major issues affecting the country. Instead of having, you know, a group of congressmen sitting in Washington voting on those things, on the same things that they're voting on, let the public vote on them, right? And there's a great book called The Wisdom of Crowds by James Sirwicky, and it basically proves the case that crowds make better decisions than individuals, right? That groups, large groups, the larger and more diverse the group, the more likely you're going to get a better, more accurate result. And there have been countless studies of this. Simple, very simple, easy to understand example is who wants to be a millionaire, right? So you have four choices and you have three options to improve your odds. One is eliminate half the answers. That'll increase your odds by 50%. The other is call an expert. And that has been shown to increase people's correct answers by 66%. So better than the 50-50 chance of eliminating two answers. And then you get to uh, ask the audience. And when you ask the audience, the correct answers, the rate of correct answers shoots up to 90 plus percent. So in the history of who wants to make a millionaire, the you know ask the audience answer was correct more than 90% of the time, right? And it beat out the other two options. Um, but there are, there are many studies along these lines, right? You state fairs, you have a big jar with a number of jelly beans or beans in it, and you could have Albert Einstein try to guess how many beans are in that jar, or you could take all the answers from everybody at the state fair and pick the average, and you would have a more accurate answer, okay? And they've done this repeatedly, so, so in many types of examples. So why wouldn't we have a participatory government now that we have the technology for direct voting, right? Your age group, your, your you know, population could impose this because you know, your people are going to rise to these positions of power. And um, the problem is, is that the system corrupts. It's not that people going into the system are corrupt. It's that the system itself corrupts. And the way it does that is not, I was in the system. I, I became uh, Nevada's attorney general. I was appointed by the governor. I served a two-year term. Um, I was supposed to run for an additional four-year term. And I got out after, my, after completing my two-year term, argued before the United States Supreme Court, 190, finished my two-year term and left politics and the practice of law forever. And um, I had a five to one fundraising advantage. I had raised 1.2 million in the first three months. My opponent, who's now a United States Senator, raised 165,000. So I had incumbency and I had a five to one fundraising advantage. And as a Republican in 2008, um, the state had a, a Republican majority. 
So I was a shoe in to win. And I gave all the money back and I raised money for my Democratic opponent. But why did I get out? Why did I get out? I got out because I felt that when I got in, my ego told me that I could make a difference. And when I got in, I found out that I really couldn't make a difference because I was alone. I was, I, I was not a true Republican. I was, you know, what they call a rhino, perhaps a Republican name only. I was pro-choice, you know, pro-reasonable gun restrictions, uh, pro-LGBTQ. And, and so I didn't fit into the Republican side, but I didn't fit into the Democrat side because I wasn't a Democrat, right? And so they were not receptive towards me. And, um, and I felt that I didn't have the support of other elected officials that were of a similar mindset that would cause me to be able to create enough of a group or, or uh, amass enough of a constituency to create the kind of moderate change that I believe was necessary, right? If we have 325 million people in the United States and they are equally divided between the left and the right, my feeling is that no one from the left and no one from the right can, can lead that equally divided country, that that country must be led from the center um, because it falls on both halves. And so 80% is really in the center and 10% on each fringe are the fringe elements that happen to be very loud, right? And that we shouldn't be led by this 20% loud fringe element. We should pick the best ideas from the left and the best ideas from the right and we should move forward with those best ideas for the country, for the for the betterment of the country. And um, also because of my age, I, um, you know, I used to have uh, strong opinions about uh, certain things. Now I feel that it really doesn't matter what I think. My personal opinion is insignificant. It's, you know, who gives a shit what I think? It's It's what is best for the country. It's not what's best for me. It's what does the country believe? What does the country want? What is best for the country? And when you start to think in those terms, that's, that's a basis for optimism, right? That's, that's where we need to go. And so I believe that your generation will come to that conclusion and that you will move in that direction. Um, what you have to be wary about is people who enter pro- politics with the best of intentions but then become corrupted by the special interests and become influenced by the special interests and become interested by the party apparatus and the party hierarchy. And they go in with the best of intentions, but then they become co-opted and, and, and they become part of this, you know, legacy system that, that really needs to go. And, um, and so you have to, someone has to come out with a blockchain system, a blockchain voting system, that you know is accessible to everybody on their phone. That uses you know high-end technology, high-end encryption, high-end facial recognition is ubiquitous, so that everybody has it. Anybody can vote. There's complete access, right? Even the poorest people can have access. Um, you know, whether- and real-time feedback with people with yeah. the, the numbers of votes going in. Yeah, yeah I think uh, you know Elon Musk has talked a lot about the, sort of the uh, proposed government on Mars. Uh, being a direct demo- democracy with like this sort of sunset clause where uh, laws expire rather than just like being set out into the future with no end date in sight and yeah. and thus in the future causing like this very restrictive environment for for innovation. Um, I want to take you from uh, from here to Mars. Actually, my next question. Sure. Um, so one thing that I would ask you on Musk, and I'm going to ask you too, is gravity is a constant. And all human, like all of our interactions, gravity is really the only constant. And that includes the way that your brain is structurally formed. And as you said, you know, the structure of your brain informs its function. And so if we were to be, if we were to exist in a, in a, um, in, in space, whether it be artificial gravity or on Mars with like 38% of Earth's gravity, what would be, and I know you're not going to have an answer, like the long-term effects, like would that be a human being if their 
the structure of their brain is influenced by a different constant? Or just what do you think about that? Yeah, so first of all, I don't think that there are um, too many, if any, constants, um, even gravity. Um, so the reason that they call it theoretical physics is because it's theory. And even gravity is a theory. Um, it's, it's based on what we know today. And, and that's not to say that our knowledge is not going to increase to a point where even our conception of gravity changes, right? Um, uh, there was a futurist uh, that said that, um, um, that even our concepts of evolution will become laughable um, in time. That uh, so there's so much that we think we know today, um, but but when you realize that first of all, um, so we know that that AI we're we're going to reach the singularity. Um, guys like Ray Kurzweil at Google say it's going to happen by 2029, which is seven years away. Uh, guys like Hawking say it'll be the greatest event in human history, uh, greater than fire, greater than the wheel. Um, Kurzweil goes on to say by the 2040s, artificial intelligence will not be our equal. It will be a billion times, a billion times more capable than human intelligence in 20 to 30 years, um, that our neural cortex will be connected to the cloud. I mean, all these spectacular, uh, potentials that they're discussing. And it really doesn't matter to me whether they're five years off, 10 years off or 20 years off. These things are coming and, and they're part of our future. And so when they come, when we have a level of intelligence that is not even, you know, not a billion times our own, but even double our own, double our own intelligence, double Albert Einstein and Stephen Hawking, or triple or quadruple or a hundred times, right? We're going to start to get answers that have eluded man since the dawn of time. And, and where all of human intelligence has, has created this, this volume of knowledge as of today, in 10 years, um, we're being told that this volume of knowledge will double in 10 years, okay? Now, once we hit that, that uh, increased velocity of AI, right? Um, it won't take 10 years for that knowledge to double, right? So there is, there is a major acceleration that is going to occur in learning, in our level of knowledge, in, in you know, what we come to know over the next 10 to 20 years during your lifetimes. And, um, and I don't know what that's going to teach us, but um, it may teach us that what we think about gravity is not what it is at all, you know? Um, that it may have, you know, no influence or it may have a profound influence or it may have an influence that can be mitigated by a certain, you know, thing, right? Um, you, you do something in that space capsule or on Mars in that living condition that mitigates the effect of what it is that you're currently concerned about, right? So um, essentially, I think the, the most important thing is to, the, the, the first step to wisdom, I believe, is embracing your ignorance, right? If you don't, if you don't see yourself as ignorant, then why would you be searching for more knowledge, right? If you've already got the answers, um, why, why keep looking, right? So it's, it's that belief that I don't know everything that makes me want to keep learning, right? Um, and and I, I like to say there's, there, uh, well, Al Aristotle said, the man who thinks he knows everything knows nothing at all. I like to say that the only thing that I know for certain, there's only one thing that I know for certain, Right? I don't even know that I'm alive. The only thing I know for certain is that there is a great deal that I do not know. That I know for certain. <laughs> you know, everything else is fair game, right? We could be in a sim. Elon Musk was asked, you know, what would you ask God if, if uh, you had the chance to talk to them? And he said, I'd ask her what's happening outside the sim, <laughs> right? In other words, we're all in a sim and what's going on outside the sim, right? So I don't know if Musk is right about that. I don't know, um, you know, I, I don't uh, assume to have a, a very 
clear and solid understanding of just about anything. I just, I may know more than someone else, but that doesn't mean that I'm right, or that doesn't mean that, uh, that I actually have the correct answer. I think it's apparent for sure. And, you know, I think I don't like to speak in kind of generalities in terms of on behalf of my generation, because, you know, I've not spoken to all of them individually or any, anywhere close to that amount, but I, I get the impression that we do a good job of being aware of the problems. I think that's also sort of like one of the, the benefits or, or the features of a lot of the media that we participate with in mass is that it problems rise to the surface. We focus on the negatives and that's kind of because of psychology and whatever else, uh, kind of the question I'd like to ask is you mentioned that you're a strategist and kind of, I think a lot of people very much on the same page with you, that just, there's a lot of really complex and pending problems. What do you think are the, and I know this was a lot of your initial motivation for writing the previous book and then this book, just like the core individual strategies for surviving, thriving, navigating everything that's to come. Cause I don't think it re requires much persuasion, especially for our generation to be like, this is bad. This is bad. This is bad. This is going to be crazy. This yeah. is going to be, but that, that this is going to make that look like nothing, but then this is going to, and then, so it's like, what do you do? What do you do as an individual? Yeah. yeah. Whether that's on the, on the scale of your day or that's the scale yeah. of like your so just general are, attitudes. Yeah. So there's mindset. Some simple, there's some simple pieces of advice that I would leave everyone with. Um, one is that, um, so visuals are good. Um, you know, because you remember them, right? So the first thing uh, in Millennial Samurai, I talk about a double-edged sword, that your brain is a double-edged sword. So understand that that's what your brain is. Understand that it is the greatest tool that has ever been conceived that you will ever have uh, for advancing your life, but that it is, it is also a looming liability, right? It is, um, it is extremely malleable. It is, uh, you can be influenced. Um, you can be targeted um, and you can be influenced by information that will enter your brain outside of your conscious awareness. You have no ability to stop that information from entering your brain. Okay. But you do have an ability to interrogate the information that you become consciously aware of. Right. So, um, so once you have a thought, about something, you have the ability to interrogate that thought, right? And not accept it as being necessarily true, right? So, so the first piece of advice is treat your brain as a double-edged sword, um, which means you want to constantly sharpen that sword through lifelong learning, right? So develop a love of learning, right? Some people love chocolate, some people love bread, pretzels, whatever, right? Um, learn to love learning, okay? Um, there is great joy and satisfaction in learning. Um, and everything you learn, whether you think it has application to you or to your life, I used to be uh, one of the worst at this. I would, uh, um, you know, think that algebra had no relevance to me because I was going to be a lawyer. You know, and so I didn't need to learn or worry about algebra or criminal law. I didn't need to study criminal law because I wasn't ever going to represent criminals. Right. So and I ended up arguing my a criminal law case before the United States Supreme Court. And yet in law school, I, I skipped out of criminal law the entire class. I, I literally only went the first day. So because I thought I would never use it. Right. So um, silly me because you know, my biggest case happened to be a criminal law case. Fortunately, I studied it at the time I needed to and, and I won nine zero, but still, um, the, the value of learning is in, uh, it's, it's its own reward. It sharpens your sword. It makes your brain that much more formidable, right? So your tool, your weapon becomes that much more formidable um, through the process of learning. You're sharpening that sword. So that's one thing. Uh, another thing I would tell you is an open mind is absolutely essential, right? Um, it's been said that musicians, uh, some of the world's greatest musicians may have had the greatest brains like Mozart, right? Um, because music requires the use of so many different parts of the brain that um, it exercises the brain um, and sharpens the sword. And so uh, Frank Zappa, 
a musician, uh, once said, your brain is like a parachute. It doesn't work if it isn't open, right? Okay, so I very much believe in that. Um, you have to have an open mind. You have to treat your brain like a parachute that doesn't work if it isn't open. And because of the rate of change, because of the rate of change, a good visual is you're jumping out of an airplane and you're plummeting to the ground because that's the speed at which change is going to occur. Um, but you have a parachute. The good news is you have a parachute and it's your brain. The bad news is it doesn't work unless it's open. So you have to have this open mind. Another, another concept that I think you need to uh, appreciate and embrace is that alternative perspectives are not threats, they're assets. It's like if I'm driving down the road and I've got my wife in the passenger seat and, I'm, and I wanna change lanes, she's got a view outside the passenger window that I don't have, right? I may have the rear view mirror, I may have the side mirrors, but I don't have the ability to stick my head outside the passenger window and take a look behind. My wife does. So it gives an alternative perspective. I want that perspective, right? That perspective enriches me. It's a perspective that I don't have. The same thing is true of, you know, some guy in war-torn Syria, right? That lived a very different life than I lived, right? He's got a different perspective. I want to hear his perspective, right? So these are kind of concepts that I think can help you survive and thrive in the 21st century. And that's what Millennial Samurai is all about. That's why I wrote this book. The, the, the whole, so look at the book as like a duffel bag. If I were to drop you off in the Amazon rainforest and I were gonna give you a duffel bag, we know what I would put in the duffel bag. I would put water, I would put uh, some mechanism to create a fire, I would put something to you know, chop wood or a, a knife or a saw or a, a hatchet. There's certain things I would put in that duffel bag. Millennial Samurai is what I believe you need to read and understand and embrace um, in order to be more formidable and be more prepared for the life that you're going to encounter. I think that the life that you're going to encounter is going to have amazing, amazing opportunities. You are living in the most extraordinary period in human history. It's a gift. It's a gift to be living in this age, but it's not without cost, right? It's going to require that you raise your game because you are going to live in a more dynamic, radically and rapidly changing environment. And you need to be able to surf that tsunami. You need to be able to learn to dance with machines. And, if, and for those who can do that, and those who are committed to lifelong learning, those who are committed to constant adaptation, those who exhibit leadership skills and run at problems instead of away from problems, those people, are going to have the most extraordinary lives of anyone who has ever walked this earth. And you can be one of those people. Um, you just need to follow some of those, those uh, um, kind of uh, guidance that, that I'm offering. Have an open mind, think critically, understand what your brain's capacity is and what its limitations are. Don't think that you know the answers. Embrace your ignorance. You know, develop a love of learning, run at problems instead of away from them. If you do all of that, I have optimism that you are going to have an extraordinary life. There will be some that have an absolutely unfathomable, extraordinary life. And there will be those that get swept away by the, by the rate of change and the ferocity of change and, and, you know, their, their fragility and their, inflexibility and their inability to adapt. Um, so you don't want to be one of those people. You want to be one of the other group. Uh, you want to be a millennial samurai. That was, uh, that's awesome. I think that's worth clipping and making as like a little loop people can listen to a little pump up. Uh, I think a couple thoughts on that is that, and then Kyle, you can, you can ask the question, but that not the, a question. I was going to say oh. you can get the book for free. You can get the book for free. Website. That's well, we yeah. should we'll mention that again at the beginning, hopefully. Yeah. Uh, just to bait people, but yeah, go I to think samurai.com and download the entire book for free. Mm -hmm. Um. So I was going to say that I think one of the most easy like frameworks for the divide between the people who are going to have like extraordinary lives and 
get swept away, right? It's kind of like the creator versus consumer dichotomy. And that's kind of like been one for a long time, right? But if you're the person, you know, TikTok has a very powerful algorithm that captures people's attention in a lot of ways. If you're someone who is releasing a piece of content that automatically gets shown to all the people who are liking it, that is a tremendous amount of leverage you're being given for free versus oh, yeah. if you're the person being exploited as the free leverage by consuming the TikTok. So this kind of like the creator versus uh, consumer paradigm, I think is like one of the better ways I found at least to like to frame that. Yeah. One of the things that, you know, you, you are, um, you know, you're challenged uh, in this circumstance by the fact that uh, things are not all the way that they should be, right? That you're going to have to make some very significant changes um, to the government and to the world that we live in. Um, so that's, you know, that's a challenge. Um, but you also have tools, you know, you just talked about, uh, TikTok and, and one of the tools, right? So you have crowdfunding, which I never had, right? In order for me to raise capital, I would have had to have found someone that I actually knew. Um, and they would have had to have believed in me and they would have had to have had money, right? So there were all these limitations on my ability to raise capital. Um, I overcame those limitations and I was still able to raise capital, but not everyone is able to. But now they have crowdfunding, right? So you are able to raise uh, small amounts of capital from large numbers of people um, to start businesses or to pursue, you know, initiatives. Um, you have uh, democratized media. You have social mm -hmm. media. You can go direct to consumer. You have TikTok. You have Instagram. You have Snapchat. You have uh, Zoom. You have... Um, all of these tools, uh, you have blockchain technology, right? Um, you have NFTs, uh, you have things that we never had, right? So there is a, uh, there's a, there's a story or a joke about uh, this guy who's standing on the shore of a rising flood and a boat comes by and, um, uh, and uh, the, the people in the boat say, uh, get into the boat. Uh, the water is rising. It's going to flood out the hill that you're on and you're going to die unless you get into the boat. And the guy says, it's okay. God will save me. Right. And so he doesn't get into the boat. So then the next boat comes, the water line is already up to the top of the hill. It's threatening to drown him. And, uh, he says, it's okay. God will save me. And the third boat comes and, uh, water lines at his knees now. And, uh, they say, get in, we're the last boat out. And uh, he says, it's okay, God will save me. And then he dies and then he goes to heaven and he meets God and he says, God, why did you forsake me? And God says, what are you talking about? I sent you three boats, <laughs> right? And so, you know, you have the boats, you have the boats, right? You have blockchain, you have social media, you have the internet, you have uh, AI coming, you know? You have these incredible tools and I believe we're at a tipping point and, and society will either move into a second enlightenment where you will create mass learning and education, free education, free learning, free healthcare, a better society, right? You'll create abundance through technology. Um, you'll increase, you'll, you'll, you'll radically increase the efficiencies of commerce and of farming and of medicine, uh, you'll you'll you know create te telemedicine where you won't need all these doctors and the inability to, to get an appointment with a doctor. I'll just look at my phone. It'll it'll uh, take a picture of my retina, and then the AI will tell me exactly what's wrong with me and exactly what I need to do. Right. So there are all sorts of things, all sorts of advances that that are going to be made possible by technology. Your job is to harness those technologies, harness those boats, and, and let that take you to safety, right? Um, instead, of allow, instead of passing the boats and you know, ignoring them or using them for frivolity, right? We've taken the internet and what are we doing with the internet? So much of the internet is used for frivolity, right? It could be used for education. It could be used for personal empowerment, right? You as a creator, um, and we're, we're birthing more and more of these creators, right? They're, they're, they're proliferating. 
And so, um, you know, people are out there trying to help other people. And that is very much the answer. It's not waiting for government to save you. It's people helping people. It's, it, we are profoundly interdependent. Human beings are profoundly interdependent. You find this in nature. You look at flocks of sterlings. You look at ant colonies. You look at bee colonies. You look at schools of fish. You look at wolf packs. You look at how animals function. They function working with one another, right? Humans are the same way. We have to work with each other. If we collaborate, we are capable of great things and have immense power. Like right now, a lot of your generation may seem may feel powerless, right? What am I going to do? What, what can I as an individual do? How can we change this? It's insurmountable. This government is going to control everything. These tech companies are going to control everything. You don't understand your power because your power doesn't come from you as an individual. Your power comes from you as a group, right? As a group, you have amazing power. You have more power than any of those institutions. You just need to organize and coalesce. But if they keep dividing you, if they keep dividing you and you keep seeing your fellow man or your you know, fellow peer as, as, as a threat and you see their ideas as threatening um, or you see their race as threatening or their economic status as threatening or their sex as threatening or their binary nature as threatened or non-binary nature as threatening, um, then, then that's going to keep you apart. It's going to limit your strength. It's going to weaken you. And it's going to make you vulnerable to all forms of control and manipulation. And so you cannot allow that to happen. You must, you must unite. However you do that, and you do that through, you do that through openness, you do that through an open mind, you do that through a subjugating of your own beliefs, right? You, you articulate your beliefs, but you don't become so wedded to them that it has to be your way, okay? It's not about you. It's not about me. It's about us. If you have that mindset that it's not about me, it's about us, then your power is unlimited as a group. Un absolutely unlimited. You could bring down this government. You could you know, take out the tech companies. You could do whatever you wanted to do. I wish I had the bomb button. I would press it. <laughs> Dropping bombs. We have we can we have editing. We have the power to edit asynchronously. Uh, and they could point. look as if we we had the button live. Just kind of go like this, and then someone will coordinate it yeah. uh, offhand. One comment I want to make, kind of tying together your two points there, is that you know critical thinking, and I want to avoid sounding cliche, being like I completely agree with you that critical thinking is essential. I think that a tool people should be aware of for critical thinking. That's very simple. It's just listening to critical thinkers, like finding critical thinking role models. Because again, I think that's one of the most difficult role models to find in kind of your day-to-day -day life. And one of the, the superpowers of the internet, though it existed widely through books and such, is being able to just like find critical thinkers and listen to them. Because, you know, in terms of like one of the things with the internet is like kind of like, you know, making the world a lot smaller. You can like if you didn't have a mentor in some subject in your area, you didn't have a way to learn that. But now you have can, you know, download the information from someone like yourself, for example. Um, so I think like just, and, you know, you have Nassim Taleb as like a recommended author in kind of your books, right? Like he's that. one example of someone who's just like reading his book. You're like, oh, that's what it means to like kind of think like yep. not in every capacity, right? Because he's just like everyone else and gets things wrong. And I think in the past couple of years has become less credible with a lot of people who used to be his fans. But you read his book and you're like, oh, that's like, it just keeps busting him down. Or you listen to someone like Andy Frisella and you just like have, a, you need a role model for, like I think some of these soft skills and maybe I'm in general making a theory here that like the way to learn soft skills in general is to like have a role model for those soft skills. But it's like, you know, there's plenty of people who can speak well publicly, so you just like emulate them. But I, I just don't think people have a readily available role model of like a, a true critical thinker, and that is like really powerful, like unlock for being like, okay, that person like cuts through the noise and like thinks for themselves. And I think like that's key for people to have. I, I agree. Um, I would tell you this that that there is a that there are principles to critical thinking, right? One of the uh, when I was 12 years old. I read a book um, called Ogilvy on Advertising from David Ogilvy. 
David Ogilvy is widely regarded as the father of advertising. Okay. Copywriting he was a legends. Guy. He came from a, you know, kind of uh, almost aristocracy type family or wealthy family. He was expected to go on and do, uh, you know, uh, things like run for prime minister or something like that. And um, he, be he got into the advertising business. And in his book, Ogilvy uh, on advertising, he, he offered two pieces of, uh, pieces of advice that I never forgot. One was hire people that are smarter than yourself, which is great advice, right? If you're building a business, um, you always want to hire the smartest people you possibly can. Um, but the other piece of advice that really stuck with me was what he called a helicopter perspective. A helicopter perspective. So Ogilvy talked about this concept of a helicopter perspective. And he basically said, a helicopter perspective is the ability to rise above a problem and look at it from a 360 degree angle, right? Look at it from all different angles, all different perspectives. And when you do that, you're going to get insights that the person who doesn't do that isn't going to have. You're going to have a broader base of information. You're going to have a body of information that creates a more accurate picture, an overall accurate picture. And that assists with critical thinking. So a helicopter perspective, even, you know, role models are great because you see how they think and, and it teaches you, you know, that it is possible and here's how they do it. But the way I do it and the way I've done it for 30 years is by employing that helicopter perspective. I try to gather information from all perspectives. So for example, if I had, if, if I was a lawyer back in the day and you came into me with a problem, right? And it was a problem between you and Kyle, right? I would ask you to explain your problem to me, but then I would ask you to role play because Kyle wasn't in the room, right? You're coming into me alone as a client and you're in partnership with Kyle and there's a problem and you're coming in and you're explaining the problem to me. And I'd say, okay, I've heard your point of view. Now, um, Lewis, tell me, you know, pretend you're Kyle and, and speak to me as Kyle and tell me what's wrong with Lewis, <laughs> right? And I would wanna hear Kyle's side of the story. Right. I would need to hear Kyle's side of the story to understand the problem. Right. And then I might ask, well, Lewis, who else is involved in the company? You know, um, and who else do you talk to that you've talked to about this problem and what do they think? And then who else is involved on Kyle's side and who's influencing him and who's advising him and what do they think? And I try to gather as much information as possible. You know, what if some what do some of your customers think? What do some of your suppliers think? You know, have, have has this problem impacted anybody else? Are there any other people that have a stake in this? What do they think? Right? That's that's a helicopter perspective. That's gathering all the information that you can to analyze the problem. It's not just listening to what you have to say about how you see the problem. Okay. So that's how you critically think. That's how you that's how you engage in complex problem solving, right? Is you gather information from as many different perspectives as possible. You try to learn more about the problem than anyone else. And then you analyze the problem critically and objectively um, and fairly where you're not taking sides. You're really trying to be objective. And um, that's that's critical thinking. I love that. I think uh, the 360. I think a lot of what you're saying kind of resonates with itself and, and that's a sign of like authenticity and, and the truth is just how many different lines you could draw between a lot of the different messages that you're trying to send. Uh, before we are done, I do want to ask you about your real estate business, how you got into it, what, you know, have been sort of some of your best decisions and what your outlook for real estate as an asset class in the face of, you know, uh, a hundred different things that could change the entire world. Yeah. We both are. Yeah. So, so first of all, real estate has been a source of wealth, probably the primary source of wealth for um, uh, something like uh, three quarters of the world's most wealthiest people. Um, real estate has been um, behind it. Um, I think real estate uh, is and and uh, probably always will be a major source of value. 
Um, there's a finite amount. Um, obviously, uh, more precious and more coveted real estate like beachfront property, right, will always be, um, you know, more valuable than other property. Um, but there's tremendous opportunities in, in, in all areas um, that you're in the world that you're now living in. Uh, real estate is very much one of them. Um, I'll tell you, you know, a little bit about my own personal experience. First of all, the real estate market is changing. Uh, big companies are getting into it. Um, something like, um, I forget the statistic, but it's something like 60% of uh, single family homes um, mm -hmm. are owned by large corporations and REITs today. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so they're driving up prices. Um, they're making it, uh, they're, they're on both the single family home buying uh, side and they are on the apartment complex uh, building side, right? So uh, they're, they're building these large, uh, compl uh, large collections of apartment complexes all over the country or all over the world. And so when you, when you create those monopolies, when you start to have one company o o owning 80,000 single family homes, you know, and uh, um, millions of units of apartment complexes, um, then you start getting a, mono uh, a monopolistic threat to um, a competitive environment, making it more difficult for somebody like yourself to compete with those uh, people, right? You want to go in and and uh, rehab and flip homes and you're bidding on them and you know you're 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 limited to what you think is a uh, um, a price you can pay because your objective is to buy the home fix it up and sell it well somebody else's objective uh, to you know buy it fix it up and rent it for the next mm -hmm. 30 years might be willing to pay more you know so um anyway um one of the things that uh, I think is important to um, success in any endeavor, um, especially in real estate, but in any in any endeavor endeavor, is finding opportunity in adversity, um, looking for creative opportunities that other people don't see, um, and so um, I can tell you that uh, the most successful real estate deal that I did was a. Um, I bought a piece of property, um, three and a half acres in downtown Las Vegas. I bought it uh, for two and a half million dollars. Um, and uh, the at the time that I bought it, I remember my dad saying, you know, George, you know, this is like a really shitty looking piece of property. Why would you buy this property? It's a dilapidated warehouse, you know, in a grimy area. Why would you buy this property? And um, he didn't understand it, um, but I saw I had a vision as to why I thought it was valuable. And here's the analysis that I went through. Twenty five years earlier, I had been in San Diego as a young lawyer and I saw the city of Las or city of San Diego condemn a one square block area. And uh, through eminent domain, they condemned this one block area and they sold it to a developer named Ernie Hahn for a dollar. And Ernie Hahn built Horton Plaza in downtown San Diego. And, and Fifth Avenue, which ran right next to Horton Plaza, was nothing. It was, you know, uh, a rundown, grimy downtown area. Sixth Avenue, Seventh Avenue, Eighth Avenue, Ninth Avenue, Tenth Avenue were even worse. They were essentially barrio. They were, you know, just dilapidated areas. Nobody was investing in them. But once Horton Plaza got built, then Fifth Avenue developed into Restaurant Row and it got developed. And once Fifth Avenue became Restaurant Row, then Sixth Avenue and Seventh Avenue and Eighth Avenue and Petco Park and everything else started to develop, right? So it took like a 20, 25 year period for that metamorphosis to occur. So I was in San Diego when it began. And then I moved to Las Vegas, back to Las Vegas, and I opened up my own law practice and started practicing law in Vegas. And, um, and I saw the city of Las Vegas acquire a 61 acre parcel in the middle of downtown Las Vegas. And it was in the newspaper, right? And I was a downtown Vegas lawyer at the time. And I saw this and I thought, you know what, this reminds me very much of Horton Plaza. And what happened to Horton Plaza is probably going to happen around this 61 acres. 
right? Once that 61 acres becomes an anchor, once it becomes developed by the city, once they put a symphony plaza in and a baseball stadium and the world market center and outlet malls and all these other things, then development is going to occur around that 61 acres. So what I did was I drew a circle, a one mile radius around the 61 acres before anything began to develop. And I started to identify all the properties within a one mile radius. And I put together binders listing every single property and every single owner and a description of the property of everything that was in one mile. Then I went through those binders and I said, okay, what can I eliminate? Because I got a lot of property here to look at and some of it I clearly don't want to buy. So what can I take off the list, right? And I thought, well, anything, you know, what I want is raw land. That's really what I want because um, I don't want to buy a business and I don't want to pay for an existing building. I just want raw land. I want the most land I can get for the least amount of money. So I don't want to buy a, a going business. So any property that had a going business on it, I took out of the binder and I said, okay, garbage. This is not on my list. Not, it doesn't make it to my short list. Anything that had a nice building on it, I took off because it wasn't for me. Might've been for a different buyer who wanted to transform the building, but that's not what I wanted. I wanted raw land. So that came off my list. There were no large parcels of raw land within that one mile radius. There was something on virtually everything or it was a small parcel. So I found a two and a half acre parcel that had a dilapidated tear down warehouse. There's no way anybody was gonna build anything on this warehouse. They weren't gonna use or resurrect the warehouse. They were gonna tear it down. It was just an additional cost to me that I had to factor in was removing the building, right? To get me to the raw land. It was two and a half million dollars. It was three and a half acres. I bought it. My dad thought I was crazy, but I bought it. Um, I went to a wealthy cousin who, you know, is a billionaire. And uh, I said, listen, I found this property. And um, ultimately I convinced him to help me with the down payment, uh, borrowed the rest and bought the property. After I bought the property, two and a half acres, uh, uh, I'm sorry, three and a half acres for two and a half million dollars, three and a half acres for two and a half million dollars, I went next door to the property right across the street and I saw that they had three acres. They had some buildings and a going business on it, but I wanted to see if I could buy their property as well to create a bigger piece of property. So I go next door and I say to the guy, you know, what do you want for your property? You've got three acres, I'd like to buy it. And he said, I want $10 million. And I said, $10 million, I just paid two and a half million dollars for a larger piece of property right across the street, three and a half acres. He said, good for you. I said, I'll tell you what, I'll sell you my property for $10 million. It's bigger than yours. And he said, no, I won't pay $10 million. And I said, well, I didn't think you would. I said, how, so, so this is option generation. And this is looking for opportunity in adversity. So I'm being told, no, that's an adversity. I'm, I'm still pushing. I'm still looking for opportunity. So I'm saying, okay, let's flip it. Let's have you buy me. He says, no. So a lot of people might've given up, right? My next question was, all right, how about this? You name the price. I don't care what the price is. So you're going to be the person who establishes the price. So you know it's a fair price. I get to decide if I'm a buyer or a seller, right? So you get to cut the cake and I get to choose which half I'm going to take, right? I'm gonna give you the knife, let you cut the cake, but I get to choose which side I want, right? And he says, no, I'm not gonna do that either because uh, I wouldn't sell mine for less than 10 million and I wouldn't uh, pay 10 million for yours. So a lot of people would have given up at this. And they would have said, okay, well, that's the end of it. So I didn't give up. I said, all right, how about this? How about we combine our two properties? We put them together and we market them for $20 million. And then we split 10 million each, right? And by the way, there's a cul-de-sac that runs between our two properties. It's one and a half acres. And since it only services our two properties, if we were to merge the two properties, we could vacate the cul-de-sac. So if we put the two properties up for sale, 
anybody who buys both of them will be able to vacate the cul-de-sac and add an acre and a half. So you're three acres, I'm three and a half acres. You, you vacate the cul-de-sac, you add an acre and a half. Now that buyer for 20 million has an eight acre parcel of vacant property. They can take down the buildings of vacant property in Las Vegas and downtown Las Vegas. The Cosmopolitan Hotel is built on eight acres, right? So they can build a high rise hotel or a high rise condominium on this. Maybe they'll pay $20 million for this and we'll both get the 10 million that we're looking for, right? He says, I'll do that deal on one condition. I said, what's the condition? He said, if you let my son be the real estate agent and get the commission, I said, done, done. Your son can list it. So his son listed it. And within four months, we had it in escrow for $20 million. I had paid two and a half million for, my, for mine. When four, uh, four months later, I'm looking at a $10 million payoff. Um, I uh, structured the contract as uh, 90 days, uh, your money goes hard. They put up $750,000 hard in 90 days, no contingencies after 90 days, you must close. Um, and, uh, um, and it happened. Uh, the closing was a year after for capital gains treatment. Um, and uh, we closed on the property for 20 million. I got my 10 million, he got his 10 million. Um, I did a 50-50 deal with uh, my cousin who put up, uh, he put up the 1 million uh, deposit we borrowed a million and a half that we both signed on. We were 50-50, I put up zero dollars. So I, I was in it for no money. And, uh, and, and at the end of the year, uh, we got $10 million. He got, uh, um, uh, so we paid off the, uh, the two and a half million dollar loan. We netted seven and a half million dollars. He got uh, three and three quarter million. Um, and I got three and three quarter million. And uh, he got it in a year. Uh, for putting up a million dollars. Um, and uh, he, he's, even though he's enormously successful in, in, on Wall Street, he's the world's largest short seller. He opened up the envelope with his $3.75 million check. And he said to his secretary, Joan, we're in the wrong business. Because <laughs> the return was so great. So you know, that's just an example of creative thinking. It's an example of perseverance. It's an example of thinking outside the box. It's an example of not giving up. It's an example of action is magic, taking action. You know, I had gone to my cousin three years earlier and I had said, give me money to buy downtown real estate. And uh, he wouldn't give it to me. This was in 2002. 2002, I went to him and I said, I want to raise $5 million to buy downtown real estate. I can buy it at $10 a foot. It then went up to as high as $200 a foot by 2005. So I went back to him in 2005 and I said, had you given money in, me money in 2002? Had you given me $5 million in 2002, I would have turned it into $50 or $100 million. Now, God damn it, give me a million dollars to buy this piece of property. And he said, okay. <laughs> And he gave it to me. And, uh, and so that's, you know, that's an example of, you know, how something, how you can make something happen from not even having the money to invest. You know, I didn't put up a dollar. Is there a foreclosure for the local? Are you at liberty to disclose if there's anything standing on this land that I might be familiar with? If not, not a big deal. Oh, it's behind the wholesome loft. It's behind the wholesome loft. It's uh, ultimately the, uh, the state of Nevada. Uh, ended up coming in and eminent domaining the property. Um, and they had to, so it was very interesting the way things happened. Uh, first of all, I bought it in 2005, um, bought and sold it. Now, let's see, hold on. Yeah, I bought it. I, uh, we, we, we closed on the property. Oh, let me remember the dates now. Um, it was around 2005, 2006 that I bought it and closed. And in 2000, and so now the seller had it. I mean, the, the buyer had it. And now 2008 comes along. And you know, the housing crisis collapsed in 2008. And they were holding the property in 2008. Um, 
And, um, but then the city of Las Vegas came in, or the state of Nevada, I'm sorry, came in and eminent domain the property from them, from the buyer. And so the state ultimately had to uh, pay that buyer the 20 million that they had paid to us, the sellers. Um, and so the property is currently vacant, owned by the state of Nevada, and it's being used, I think, as a staging area for Project Neon. So all of the equipment for Project Neon is staged on that property today. Eventually- Is that the, the dome? State, I'm sorry? Is that the dome coming up? What the, is Project Neon? Well, Project Neon is the highway overpasses in the downtown area. Okay. And so what the state is going to do for do with it down the road, um, I, you know, I don't know if they're going to keep it, if they have a very strategic use for it, or if they're going to sell it to a private developer Maybe we can the, who will eventually buy it back build, from a build the Chanos Casino on it with the uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. artificially yeah. intelligent that would be uh, great. Uh, pit bosses. You know what I mean? There you go. Yeah. Well, the, the thing is, there are all sorts of these opportunities that are out there. Um, you have to, you know, it's like, it's like, uh, the sales business, right? You're selling encyclopedias door to door. You knock on 10 doors and they may all slam their, you know, door in your face, but the, the, the 11th door opens up, right? And so, um, you look at all these different properties and, you know, some of them are going to have sellers, uh, owners that do not want to sell, Right. Um, they're, they're carrying no debt on the property. Um, they're not motivated to sell. Um, they are unrealistic in their expectations. Um, they're, you know, really tough intransigent negotiators, whatever the reason you pass on those people, right? Just move along. And you find this other person who is over leveraged, right? The economy has taken a turn. Uh, they need some liquidity. They might have wanted to hold the property for a long time, but now they need some liquidity. And so they become a motivated seller. Um, or you come up with some kind of a creative arrangement where you put them into the deal, right? They might not want to sell just for cash. They might want income. And so you put them into the deal where you can show them, here's the income. I'll elevate your income level, right? Um, and I'll give you a unit that you can live in, you know? Um, there's all sorts of things that you can do. You just have to be more creative than the other person who tried to buy it and they said no to. Or keep Call muted if you're saying something. Right deal. I just yeah. said yes, sir. Keep searching I'd, for the deal that works. <laughs> it's, uh, I love it. Well, I think that is a good story to close out on. Um, George, if you could recommend just one chapter from your book so people can We'll hook them, right? They're like, oh, a book. It's whatever day of the week I'm listening to this and whatever. Yeah. So it's, you can get the PDF online for free, zero risk. If you like it, then you can choose to buy the hard copy because you got to have it after you've skimmed it. Uh, what's the one chapter people should start with that they can access for free on your website? Chapter one, critical thinking, right? That's where it all starts. So read the intro. That'll give you an introduction into how the world is changing, why you need to be motivated to learn, um, why adaptation is critical, um, you know, how to sharpen your sword, then read critical thinking. And, um, what happens with the book is I believe it's like Lay's potato chips that the, the chapters are so short, they're only one to three pages. So the investment of time on the part of the reader is very minimal, right? You might invest two or three minutes in reading a chapter and the payoff of investing that two or three minutes should exceed the value of the two or three minutes. So you feel that you've gotten a good return on value, right? You've invested your time and you've gotten a payoff from what you learned that exceeded the investment of time. And so that causes you to read the second chapter and the third chapter. And it just goes on like Lay's potato chips. I had a 14 year old who read the book from cover to cover, woke up in the morning, couldn't wait to read the book and didn't put it down until late at night when he went to bed and he finished the whole book in one, one sitting. Um, he's a very, you know, uh, intelligent 14 year old. He's like an international speaker, but, um, you know, he just couldn't put it down. Um, I had, uh, um, I've gotten great reviews. If you look on amazon.com and you read the reviews about the book, uh, they're fantastic five-star reviews. Um, 
So just read the reviews, read read the first intro and just look at the table of contents. And you'll I be think hooked. that that'll be that'll be that'll be enough yeah. for you to, to yeah that uh, catches your interest to too. You're like and it's free, so go do it right now. Yeah, yeah, and you can jump to any chapter. You know, so look at the table of contents and see what interests you. You know, and then That's read true. the chapter that interests you, and that'll that'll cause you to you know just pick and choose the chapters. There's no order to it. So you can jump around. So just, you know, read whatever chapters interest you and it'll pull you in. All righty. Well, I think that is a good place to close this out. George, thank you so much for your time today and definitely recommend people check out the book. Well, thank you guys very much. Appreciate it. Please include course, a link yeah. uh, to the we'll book. We'll have so that uh, when Instagram, you Instagram, Facebook, all your different things, yeah. maybe a Wikipedia page, you know, we'll get it all in there. Yeah. And we'll tag, email you tag, as well. Tag me and I'll share it. Yes, sir. That's going to close out this conversation with George Chanos, former Nevada Attorney General, and of course, current chairman of Capriotti's and Wing Zone. Fun time. Three takeaways from me, and then I will send you on your way. The first one is about meta skills. So we did a conversation about a year and a half ago with someone named Jeff Woods. He's the host of the One Thing podcast based on the One Thing book. And the most impactful lesson to me from that conversation was the habit of creating good habits is the most important habit. I really like that takeaway, and I like the similar meta skill shared in this conversation of learning to love to learn is one of the most important things you can learn. Second thing from me is the distinction between all perspectives and both perspectives. George, of course, getting it right, in my opinion. I think that we covered in this conversation how, you know, powers that be, the notorious air quote, they, and air quote, uh, they try to, you know, divide us. They make us debate silly things that aren't really the real issue, and it kind of distracts us and makes us not like each other. And one of the most deceptive tools of kind of that division, instilled division, if you will, is making people think that the majority of issues only have, you know, two sides, for and against, good and bad, evil and, and, and righteous. And George, with his helicopter perspective, borrowed from the copywriting legend. Copy, who's the legend here? Can't remember. It wasn't Gary Halbert. It was Ogilvy, David Ogilvy. Anyway, uh, I stood up during that part. For anyone watching on YouTube, I tried to find the book. Couldn't find it. Disappointing. It looked silly. And I never explained myself to George. He's probably like, where did he go? Uh, maybe he was able to deduce that I was trying to find the book. Anyway, the... Thinking or the framing that all sides, all topics, all debates only have two sides makes it very easy to, you know, dislike the other side because they're opposite of you and they're different versus seeing a situation from all sides. You know, there's a spectrum, there's a circle, maybe it's actually a sphere. There's points in three dimensions of difference in terms of ways to see the topic from different angles and points of view. Maybe it's even in four dimensions. I don't know. The point is framing something as only having two perspectives is so limited and untrue and simplistic and if you catch yourself saying, you know, I, I thought about it from both sides uh, and it's a situation that has more than two sides when you think about it, you should just, you know, smack yourself in my behalf, please. Anyway, third takeaway. I, I, maybe that made sense. Uh, things have more than two perspectives is what I'm trying to say. And I said it. Okay, third takeaway is about the brain being malleable for good and for bad. Oof, that only sounds like two sides. Uh, it's complex. The brain is your greatest asset but it's also your greatest weakness in terms of, you know, your brain is where your self-doubt comes from. It's where all these negative things that it's where your susceptibility to fall into traps that are, aren't good for you. It's where your susceptibility to get hooked on something like junk food or TikTok or some other, you know, destructive habit. But it's also, you know, this hyper creative machine that if you ask it to think about, you know, the, you prompt it with anything, it's going to come up with some sort of answer. It's, it's really incredible. Uh, so continue to sharpen the sword, as George would say and become aware of different biases and weaknesses that are inherent in the machine that is your brain. And then also, you know, be aware of the things that, that grow your brain, like like exercise, like learning musical instruments, like endurance sports. And a lot of these maybe weren't covered in the conversation, maybe were just covered in his book. I don't know, that's an unfair advantage I had by being able to skim his book before um, making these takeaways. But remember, the book is free, so I'd encourage you to check it out. That is all I have for the rambling takeaways of this episode with George Chanos. I hope you enjoyed it as much as we clearly did, and I would encourage you to subscribe so you know about the next episode. But if you don't want to know about the next episode, please do not subscribe, because then you're going to know about it, and you're like, I didn't want to know about it. I think you can figure out how that works. That's all for me. See you in the next one, or not. Anyway, see ya.